and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people and unresolved cases. This is the third episode in our series about the unresolved murder of TV presenter Jill Dando in 1999. Our first two episodes discuss Jill's life, details of the murder and witnesses to the crime. We also looked at Barry George, who was convicted of the crime in 2000 and later had his conviction overturned, due to lack of evidence. In today's episode we are going to comb through the information that has come out since the murder, and the other possible theories that surround the case. It is important that if you haven't listened to the other two episodes, you go back and do that now, so that this episode makes sense. This episode does contain some descriptions that some might find distressing, so please use your own discretion when listening. The murder of Jill Dando shocked the nation, and understandably it caused many people to be distressed and outraged. The most disturbing part about the crime to most people was the fact that in the years following Barry George's release, there appeared to be no new suspects or progress on her case. Since the crime happened, the public, and particularly the newspapers, had speculated on who the perpetrator might be, and what the motive was for killing Jill. After Barry George's acquittal, it would seem that the police were back at square one, without many tips that pointed in any other person's direction. In the early days of the investigation, the police looked into a couple of particular theories in the case. One of the first theories that was looked into was that it was a personal crime which had been committed by someone close to Jill, particularly an ex-boyfriend or jilted lover. In most cases this theory would make sense, however the nature of the crime being committed almost like an assassination did not necessarily lend itself to this theory. The police had looked closely at the theory anyway, interviewing lots of people who had known Jill or had a relationship with her. The police were open to the suggestion that someone close to her had committed the crime, due to the fact that it would have been seemingly impossible for anyone to have known what time Jill would have arrived home that day otherwise. She had dropped off at home in the course of her day and would have been leaving soon as she had made plans with a friend at half twelve. If the person was known to her, they may have had an idea of what time she arrived home after staying at her fiancé Alan's house. The police looked into everyone but unfortunately nobody looked like a valid suspect as they either had an alibi for that day or just did not check out as a suspect. This was slightly baffling for police, as they were left wondering who knew where she would be, and at what time she would be there, without following her. After looking at CCTV cameras, it was discovered that nobody had looked as though they had trailed her, as she attended to her errands, and this was a very puzzling part of the case. The investigators also looked at the idea that her murder was one of mistaken identity, and perhaps the killer did not intend on targeting Jill Dando. This theory, however, was quickly discounted by police, as although the crime seemed senseless to everyone involved, it had taken place on Jill's doorstep in broad daylight, so the idea of someone mistaking both Jill and the house that she lived in was unlikely. In the days and months after the crime, the police seemed to be quickly discounting theories and it was not looking positive that they would quickly find someone. The next theory that was considered by police was the one of an obsessive stalker or someone with an unhealthy obsession with Jill. As documented in our other episodes, Jill had attracted the attention of a number of men who appeared to have an obsession with her. Some of these men had taken action to get closer to Jill in the years and months before her murder, including trying to gain access to her phone bills and utility accounts. According to David James Smith's book All About Jill, The Life and Death of Jill Dando, there were 140 suspects in the list of people with unhealthy interests in Jill. 
This was the prevailing theory in the case up until Barry George's conviction in 2000. This made more sense to police, as this would be someone who knew Jill's whereabouts and would have been watching her consistently. Despite the fact that the police were unable to establish that anyone had been following her that day, the thought that someone had been analysing Jill's movements seemed like a plausible theory. After Barry George's conviction, the police appeared vindicated in their theory. However, in 2008, this theory took a hit, after the conviction was quashed and Barry George was released. After the release of Barry George, the investigators began to look into different theories that might have explained the murder of Jill. Newspapers over the years have documented the many different theories that have been brought up. One of the prevailing theories being that Jill was killed by a Serbian hitman. Many had previously speculated that the murder had seemed professional in nature, considering that it was silent, no evidence had been left, and there had been nothing identifiable about the man seen leaving Jill's path. The idea that it could have been a Serbian hitman in particular has roots in an appeal that Jill did a few weeks before her death. The appeal had been on behalf of the Kosovan Albanian refugees that had been displaced due to the Kosovo War. The Kosovo War had begun in 1998 and ended in 1999. The war was violent and was fought between the then Republic of Yugoslavia and the Kosovan Liberation Army. The Kosovan Liberation Army consisted of a paramilitary force that wanted the separation of Kosovo from the Republic of Yugoslavia. This force was abbreviated to KLA, and part of their campaign was to preserve the Albanian culture and ethnicity. The Kosovan Liberation Army started a boycott campaign against Yugoslav forces which caused them to crack down on the Liberation Army using brute force. This reaction to the Liberation Group would be the contributing factor in the start of the Kosovo War. The subsequent displacement of people from Kosovo, particularly into Albania, was huge and became a humanitarian crisis. The scale of the displacement had not been seen since World War I, and it was said that at one point in the crisis, 4,000 people were crossing into Albania per hour. NATO became involved in the crisis and supported the Kosovo Liberation Army against what was perceived to be war crimes committed by the Republic of Yugoslavia and the then President of the Republic, Slobodan Milosevic. The introduction of NATO into the crisis showed support for the people against the Republic of Yugoslavia, and this was an act supported by many around the world. The plight of the refugees was well documented, and many news outlets took on the story and reported on what was happening with the movement of refugees. One of the presenters who reported on the crisis was Jill Dando. A couple of months before her murder, Jill had been the face of an appeal about the crisis. The appeal had been created by the Disaster Emergency Committee and had aimed to raise awareness of the situation in Kosovo and the need for money and aid to help the refugees. In the appeal, Jill comes across as warm and caring as she did in many of her other TV appearances. Her appeal would not have been the only one that was asking for help for the refugees, as many other news outlets were also reporting on the crisis. The idea that a hitman had been sent to murder Jill due to this appeal clearly was a tenuous link, and one that does not make much sense. However, there were a number of subsequent events that connected both Jill and the BBC to the Kosovo crisis. Just four days before Jill's murder, NATO bombed a TV station in Belgrade. A Guardian article in 2001 discussed that between 15 and 17 people had been killed in the attack. The bombing had angered Slobodan Milosevic, 
the president of the Republic of Yugoslavia, particularly as the TV station had been owned by the Milosevic family. NATO's reasons for bombing the TV station were that the station was known for producing propaganda on the part of the Republic of Yugoslavia and was not useful for calming tensions in the war. The Guardian article also discussed the importance of this information at Barry George's trial. Michael Mansfield QC had put forward that the police knew of threats that had been made to the BBC and its presenters. These threats came in the form of calls made to the BBC. The first call that had been made was on the 27th of April 1999, the day after Jill's murder. This call had been made to the television centre and by someone with a foreign accent. The caller had said, Your government, and in particular your Prime Minister Blair, murdered, butchered 17 innocent young people who worked like makeup artists, electricians, and technological engineers. These types of people he butchered. We butcher back. The first you had yesterday. The next one will be Tony Hall. The one yesterday that they discussed in the call was clearly referring to Jill Dando. Tony Hall was the BBC's Head of Current Affairs at the time and is now the Director General of the BBC and a member of the House of Lords, his name now being Lord Hall. There were two more calls to the BBC, another that day, and one the day after, expressing much the same sentiments. Clearly the threats did not come to fruition on the part of Tony Hall. However, was it credible that Jill may have been murdered due to her connection with the BBC? In 2012, a number of articles came out about a widow of a Serbian journalist named Slavko Kurovija who had been murdered on the 11th of April, 1999. Kurovija had been a renowned journalist in Serbia and also a critic for the Milosevic regime. Kurovija founded the Denevni Telegraph newspaper in 1996. The newspaper was critical of the government and it often was the target of strict crackdowns by the Milosevic regime. Kurovija was very outspoken about the treatment of the press and the people in Serbia, particularly after NATO had got involved with the Kosovo crisis. He described his own treatment by the regime to US Congress, as his assets for the newspaper that he ran had been seized and he was unable to continue the company. Official bombing of Yugoslavia began in March 1999 and Kurovija returned back to Belgrade to begin to start publishing his newspaper again. On the 11th of April 1999, Kurovija returned back to his house with his friend before 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The pair were approached from behind by two people. One of the people hit Kurovija in the head with the butt of a gun and the other shot him 17 times before shooting him one last time in the head. It was later found out that the Secret Service had been watching Kurovija for a number of days to learn about his movements. The striking resemblance of Slavko Kurovija's murder and that of Jill Dando was difficult to ignore. The fact that both were killed on their own doorsteps during daytime and both had been killed with accuracy and precision. The other similarity was that both had just returned home at a time unknown to others and difficult to plan for for any perpetrator. The link between the two is clearly difficult to prove, but it did throw up some questions for those close to the case. Michael Mansfield QC clearly believed that the alternate theory of the case was strong enough to argue at Barry George's trial. And while not proving credible in the eyes of the jury, there are some similarities to be compared. This theory also has some official credibility, as Michael Mansfield, who was defending Barry George at trial, also read from a National Intelligence Agency report, which had been passed to the original detectives in the case. 
The report detailed that there was some information that Jill had been killed by a Yugoslavian hitman due to the bombing of the TV station in Belgrade. The report also detailed that the man who had ordered the hit was a man named Arkan, who ran a paramilitary group called the Tigers in Serbia. Arkan was known to be a violent criminal who had gained convictions in Europe for a number of crimes such as armed robbery and attempted murder. During the crisis in Yugoslavia, Arkan ran the paramilitary group with precision and the force was much feared in the country. The group was widely condemned for having too much power and Arkan was indicted for crimes against humanity under the Geneva Convention in March 1999. In January 2000, Arkan was assassinated while in the lobby of an intercontinental hotel in Belgrade. The assassin approached Arkin and shot him in the head. The reasons for his assassination are unknown, however it has been speculated that it was because he knew too much about the regime's actions. So could this have been a plausible suspect for Jill's killer? The report documented that there was some evidence that Arkin could have travelled to the UK, even stating that there was some information about him coming by ferry so to not draw attention to himself on a flight. The report appears to point to some evidence that the theory of Jill being killed by someone hired by the Republic of Yugoslavia had some merit. DCI Hamish Campbell, however, discredited this theory at Barry George's trial by explaining that there is a lack of acknowledgement on behalf of the Yugoslavian government and that they believed that they may have taken credit for the murder if it had been ordered by them. The theory has been discounted over the years, as the investigators state that there was never enough evidence to prove the theory. Some parts of the theory are compelling, and point to a connection between the two crimes, but some links seem quite tenuous. It is understandable that investigators may not have been able to link the crimes definitively together due to their high-profile nature. Another theory that has been documented is that Jill was murdered due to her work on the TV show Crime Watch. The show documented unsolved crimes and highlighted the details in many cases that the police were struggling to solve. The TV show was watched widely in Britain and often tips that came into the show were useful in identifying suspects. The theory that Jill's work on this show made her a target for underworld figures is one that some believe is very plausible. Mark Williams Thomas, an investigative journalist, has looked into Jill's case deeply and has analysed the police files. He believes that the case is very strongly linked to Crime Watch and a criminal network. Williams Thomas was a constable and family liaison officer in Surrey from 1989 to 2000 and since then has worked as an advisor in many different capacities. In 2012, his documentary, The Other Side of Jimmy Savile, exposed the child sexual abuse scandal that would rock the BBC and TV production companies. Jimmy Savile was a famous presenter who had died in 2012, and Williams Thomas's documentary put the stories of women who said that they had been abused as teenagers by Savile into the public view. This documentary, amongst other evidence, was the spark for police to start Operation Yew Tree. This investigation looked into the abuse committed at high levels, including within celebrity circles. Many people have been looked into due to this investigation, and it has been reported that it has had a positive impact on the number of sexual crimes that have been reported. The documentary was credited with a Peabody Award due to its importance. Williams Thomas also looked into other cases, being the only British journalist to meet Oscar Pistorius during his trial. He reinvestigated Jill's murder in 2015 and looked very closely at the police reports from the time. He tracked down names on the original suspect list and interviewed people close to the case. Williams Thomas looked at an intelligence report from the time that named two men from Islington, North London, who were ordered to kill Jill 
on the orders of one of London's biggest crime families. This information apparently came from an unknown registered source who had been serving a prison sentence for murder. The man had been interviewed by investigators and had given two names to police in 2001. It was believed that DCI Hamish Campbell ordered no further action on this information as they already had Barry George on trial and did not believe that there were any other suspects. The intelligence report also stated that the suspects then broke the gun into four pieces and threw it into a canal in Islington. The detectives found one of the men and could not find the other that was named. Despite the story sounding like a break in the case, the detectives could find no link from the suspects to Jill and her murder. The theory could perhaps provide a motive for Jill's murder, which before this point had not been clear. Jill's work on Crime Watch connected her to violent crimes and perhaps put her at risk. The fact that police did not necessarily look into other leads after finding Barry George could point to the fact that police believed they had their man, despite other tips coming in that pointed in different directions. On the other hand, the police could find no link to the men named, and it is relevant to say that Crime Watch has continued to be broadcast up until the present day, and the crime did not stop the show. If this had been the motive, it did not create the effect that the perpetrators had wanted. Another theory that is sometimes connected to the murder is that an IRA group killed Jill. The IRA was an Irish paramilitary group that had existed to oppose British rule over Ireland, particularly Northern Ireland, that remains part of the UK. During the 1990s there had been a number of violent incidents in the UK. In 1996, the group had bombed the Docklands at Canary Wharf, which had killed two people and injured 39. Later that year, the IRA had bombed Manchester city centre, which had become the largest bomb attack since World War II at the time. The bomb fortunately did not cause any fatalities, due to the rapid speed of the emergency services, but it did injure 200 people and destroyed a huge amount of the city centre. The government was trying to broker a peace process during the 1990s between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. During the time that Jill Dando was living in London, the IRA would have been in the news constantly. Information about the IRA being involved somehow in Jill's murder does not perhaps have a stronger link to her as some of the other theories, however there is still some evidence. In the police files there was some information about a convicted killer who was in prison who wrote a letter claiming to be part of a four-man IRA hit squad that had killed Jill. The man had been convicted of a murder two months after Jill's death and sent to prison. The man claimed that they had shot her with a 9mm bullet and then escaped using Land Rovers to a safe house in London. The man also claimed that the group were not pursued due to the fact that the government did not want to disrupt the peace process that had been started at this point. The man had confessed, he alleged, because he did not want to see Barry George convicted for something he hadn't done. The man had been adamant about his confession and wanted the details to be known. This theory does contain some tenuous links as the man making the confession was currently in prison and it is notoriously difficult to pin down the motives of prisoners for making a confession. It is very hard to understand if the man was telling the truth or had simply used information known about the case to make the details fit. Nothing was found to point to the story's validity and there is no solid evidence. However, it is another theory that should be discussed when looking into Jill's murder. The murder did have the hallmarks of a professional hit, and from the beginning of the investigation, many had pointed to it being an accurate and criminally sophisticated crime. The evidence for this was that the murder had taken place in daylight, in the middle of the day in a busy street, without any witnesses. 
The killer had used only one bullet and was knowledgeable that this would be enough. They had also not left any DNA at the scene except the bullet. The question that many asked themselves after this senseless murder was what kind of person could have done it and did they think Barry George was capable or was there someone out there with more professional criminal experience? The theories that we have discussed and have been reported on since the crime all point to the idea of a professional hit. To me, the crime does indicate that someone had professional knowledge of murder and had some experience of tailing people. This is due to the way in which the crime was carried out and the lack of evidence left behind. I am unsure if Barry George had the capability and experience to carry out such a crime. And for that reason, I believe if I had been on the jury during his trial, I would have found it difficult to convict him on the evidence that was presented. The Metropolitan Police are still welcoming any information that anyone may have about Jill's murder, as it still remains unsolved. Jill's family and friends deserve closure and answers about what happened to her, and she should still remain in everyone's memory today. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you have enjoyed it. We would like to put together a listener theory and questions episode. So if you have anything you would like to tell us about any of the episodes we have done so far, please send them in to us. You can send them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and at our website www.theunseenpodcast.com where you can use the submission form. You can also email us at theunseenpod at gmail.com. Thank you for all the support for the podcast. Please share us with anyone you think might enjoy it. And please subscribe, rate and review us wherever you listen to your podcast. It really makes a difference. As always, I am Caprice and this has been Unseen. Unseen.